Well, good evening, and uh, welcome to our upper room service tonight, and uh, we're glad that you're here, and our aim tonight is the table, the Lord's table, and um, I've titled this message tonight, The Cup of Love Beyond Measure, and the text tonight that I'm going to be using is from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 13. We'll just look at a few verses, 31 through 35. And these verses take place in the upper room. What's interesting is this text and today and tomorrow and even Easter are so familiar to us that some ways and somehow that it could become like just something that we do. And my prayer is I've been thinking about this service and I've been thinking about the cup and I've been thinking about all that Christ did on our behalf that today would be a fresh for us. That it'd be something for us that you're going to walk away and you ride home and you're going to say, I'm glad I came. So we're going to enter into that upper room together. And that's the goal tonight. And we just pray that God would be glorified here. So if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word. John's Gospel, chapter 13. And we're going to be looking at verses 31 through 35. It's the new commandment. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I had said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another, and by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord God, teach us, Heavenly Father, from your scriptures. Open us up, Lord God, to your truths. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So what I love about the Gospel of John is, is this, is that in his Gospel, he sends, spends 50% of the Gospel on Jesus last week. Out of all the Gospels, he spends the bulk of his time within this week. And, and as you think about the text that we read tonight, I really didn't have any big idea but I would say it's about two things, glory and love. And we see this in the upper room going from an observance to an ordinance. So this upper room discourse, we're going to have an opportunity this week, tonight and tomorrow, and then going into Resurrection Sunday to really see the thoughts of our Lord the promises of our Lord, the prayers of our Lord, and be able to examine these things. And uh, so tonight, I, I want to approach this three ways. So if you've got a bulletin, you can fill this in. I've got three ways I want to approach this text. First is the purpose. Second is the significance. And third is theology, the theology. So... That's the way I'm going to walk into this text tonight. So let's together, let's look at the purpose. The historical necessity of the Passover. The question is this, is this important for us? It's a big question. But this was the desire of the Lord this week in the upper room to share the Passover with his disciples. So the church answer would be yes. It's important for us to remember God's purposes, the exodus, the atonement, 
that it could help us in our faith, in our journey, move forward. Look what it says in John 13, 31, 32. When he had gone out, what he is speaking of here is in John's gospel, they, he sends Judas out. He dips his hands into the, to get the morsel of bread, and it was that one that was the one who was going to betray Jesus. So he sends him out. He says this, do what you have to do. Go do it. And it says Satan had entered him. It's interesting. In John's gospel, he said then, now the son of man is being glorified. I find this very interesting because in the other gospels, it's not quite as clear as it is in John's that within the upper room, he did not receive the new covenant. It was after the meal, it was still in the time of the meal. John tells us where we are in the upper room. It says that he, he still had the bread, and this isn't the bread that he lifted up to heaven and gave thanks to God. This was part of the meal. All that happened after. And it was there that he had said to him that he had told his disciples that someone was going to betray him. But then he says, now the Son of Man is glorified. It's happening. It's now. And we think about this glory of God, how we see this throughout the Bible and throughout Scripture. There's one thing that we can all agree, that the Bible is about the glory of God and the Son of God being glorified in Him. It's throughout the Bible. Look at creation. God's glory in the beginning. You, you look at... The ark, God's glory in the rescue. You look at the covenants, God's glory in his promises. You look at the, uh, the sacrificial system, God's glory in atonement. You look at the potting of the seas and the rivers, we see God's glory in his might. And then we see God's glory in the divine coming of the sun, leaving exaltation of heaven and coming in humiliation, born of a woman born as a Jew, born in a manger. So the one thing that we can understand and what Jesus is saying here in the upper room is the time has come. The time has come. And, and as we see this, this time, we remember that Sunday was the triumphal entry. Monday, Jesus entered the temple and cleansed it. Tuesday, he goes to the Mount of Olives and he speaks of things to come. Wednesday, Jesus gives his last invitation and departs in rest. John 12, 36. He said this. In 12, 36, he says, While you have the light, believe in the light that you might become sons of light. And he says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. His last invitation, Jesus rests on Wednesday, and then here on Thursday, he's in the upper room with his disciples. And this is where we are today. This is where we are in the biblical narrative of the upper room. And as I said before, the purposes of the Passover and the significance for that for us We'd have to return back with Egypt to Egypt to see this exodus. And I, and I believe, in, and as I've been praying, to see this love beyond measure, a cup that changed everything. And there's a historical necessity to the reason why we're here tonight at twilight. And you can find this, in, and you can read more of it in, on your own time, but it's Exodus chapter 12. When the Lord had said to Moses and to Aaron... In the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year. Tell the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to his father's house. God told Moses and Aaron, the time is now. The time is now. And we see the same language in the upper room of the Lord. Tell the congregation of Israel that on, earth, on the tenth day, 
that they shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for their household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. It shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, and you may make it from the sheep from, or from goats. And you shall keep it until the fourth, 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any or of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of its remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, your, your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you and destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. It's an amazing picture that when the Lord and his disciples were coming to the upper room, the purpose, the initial purpose was his desire to recount with them the urgency when God calls and says, listen, I'm coming. And the urgency of the upper room, which the Lord says, now the Son of Man will be glorified. The contrast here are so unique that you can't escape them. That the importance of the Lord celebrating this was to take from an observance which they were commanded to do to an ordinance which our Lord himself will put into place. He will institute it for us. It says they'll eat in haste, meaning they'll be ready to go to this promised land. Generations to generations, they'll celebrate and recount these events. And it was given on four promises, given in Exodus chapter 6, 6 through 6. They celebrate what they call the Seder. And this Seder means the order or the way. And that's what they were celebrating. Six, uh, four promises given in Exodus chapter 6. This is what it says, so therefore... Say to the, so there, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, the first promise, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Second promise, I will deliver you for slavery to them. Third promise, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And then finally, the fourth promise, I will take you to be my people. And this is how they celebrate, to this day, how they celebrate the Seder. Out of those four promises, they're given four cups. And each cup is given throughout the, uh, the supper. And some of these traditional suppers last hours and hours. But the first cup is the cup of sanctification. I will bring you out. This is taken and drank before the meal. It comes out first, and the idea is simply this. They gather as a people set apart by God. And, and I just want to give you a picture in the importance for the purpose of Jesus doing this, that from generations to generations... Christians would gather, and it'd be because of the blood of Christ, the pouring out of his blood in a new covenant, that we meet on this day. 
and we celebrate and we remember because you are a set apart people for him. This is important. Then there's the cup of deliverance at the end of the meal. So let me just tell you something, bringing it back to what we read and, and how Judas, he said, Someone's gonna be, someone will be betray me. And it says Pete was, Peter was wondering who it was and he goes to the beloved, which was John. And John was nestled right up against Jesus. So he gave him like, find out who this is. Right? And he says, who dips his hands in with me for the morsel of bread. So what does it do? It gives us indication. This, this is at the very end of the meal. I don't even know if they've had the cup of deliverance yet. But the importance and the significance of this is simply this. Judas was part of a different kingdom. The cup of deliverance wasn't going to make any difference to him nor the cup of redemption, which he did not receive. The Lord instructed him, you go. Go do what you have to do. And it says, when he left the table, Satan entered him. So the second cup was the cup of deliverance given at the end of the meal. He would deliver them and rescue them from slavery. Then you have... um, The cup of redemption, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great judgments. He alone will buy back his people, God. The glory and righteousness of God will be made known. And then in their celebration, the final cup is the cup of praise. I will take you as my people. The hope in God is the promises of God, that God will one day restore all things. Once aliens in a land... They'll be brought into a city, our city, not built by hand, human hands, but a city built by God. This is our hope as well. 2 Corinthians 5.1, for you know that if the tent is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And here, Jesus is at the Passover. And he says this in these verses, that now the Son of Man will be glorified. What does that mean? He'll be honored. And and as you think about the word glory and honor, and you you wrap it around this in your brain that they didn't understand what this meant. It was going to be the most shameful of death. We'll be talking about that tomorrow. It'll be the most painful of death. This is how the Son of Man will be glorified in his Father, and he'll be glorified when he is raised from the dead. This is what Jesus was talking about. God's glory from the very beginning. This was before the foundations of the earth. This was set aside. That God would be glorified through his son. This is the hope and this is the purpose which we gather this evening. This is a historical necessity of the Passover. So properly we could celebrate tonight the institution of the Lord's Supper that we have to know it's important. That yes, it was instituted originally as an observance of the exodus and the exodus out of Egypt, but let me just tell you, it will be fulfilled in an exodus to the glory of New Jerusalem. And we know that happens through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remembering allows us to prepare and to move forward And this is what we celebrate tonight. This is why we come to the table tonight to remember. It has a purpose. It has a historical purpose that's so important for us that the Lord desired to celebrate it because he was going to be the lamb. He was going to shed his blood. It was him. And this brought glory to the Father. The second is the significance the current reality that grounds our faith to prepare us. This is the love that's beyond measure. And to experience the cup, this is why we're here tonight, to remember, reflect, and look forward. In John 13, Jesus goes on to say in the last three verses that we read tonight, little children, yet while I am with you, you will seek me. 
It's just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, but where I'm going, you cannot come. But a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Can I tell you, love was there before the upper room. So what's different? Because it's intensified here by the words this, just as I have loved you. It's a different love. It's not a human love or a conditional love. He said, listen, this is what this Thursday is all about. There's commandments. There's instruction. There's love. There's God's glory. And it's intensified this way. That it would be significant for us. Look what it says even farther in the upper room discourse. John 15, 12 to 14. This is the commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. That someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. There's a love that's intensified through Christ. And my prayer tonight is that you'll see the significance of this love. A love that's uncomprehensible. A love that came from heaven. A love that pass over us and Jesus bears the weight of our sin. A love that was done before the foundations of the world. He instructed Peter and John, go find this man carrying water, prepare, the, celebrate the Passover. And they did. They selected a lamb. They gathered unleavened bread. Bitter herbs, four cups. But at the very beginning of this, we enter the upper room. And they all come to the table to celebrate this Passover. And in John 13, uh, at the very beginning, we see that Jesus has some instruction for them. He takes off his garment and he gets the basin of water, and they sit, and they, he washes their feet as a servant to the house. And, and in that, remember, Peter was saying, you're not going to wash me. And he says, if I don't do this for you, you have no part in me. They begin this with instruction. Because he goes on to say, do you really understand what I just did for you? That... This is what you're supposed to do. When I'm gone, when I go to glory, we're to do this for one another. Not only an expression of love, but beloved, I want you to see something. There's no other way to get cleansed from your sin except through Christ. There's a, there's a bigger picture here. Yes, water, but yet there was a cleansing and this is the power through the gospel. Titus 3, 5 says this, that we, the, because the power of the gospel, regeneration by the washing of the word. And we're to do this. This is what was before them. He began in the upper room, before the passing of any cups, instruction. Instruction. This is what I want you to do. A commandment. Peter said this, wash all of me. He said, listen, you guys are clean. It's a, quite a time, isn't it? That he washes them and they're sanctified. They've been set apart. More importantly, people will be cleansed by the blood of Christ. Peter says, wash all of me. I hope that's your prayer. Wash all of me. Then he goes on to this in John 13, 23 through 27. It's Judas. He says this. After saying, do you understand what you've done? He says, you call me teacher and Lord and you're right, so I, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you also should wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them. I'm not speaking of all of you, though. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when he does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples were perplexed. It says the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of the disciples whom Jesus loved, John, reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that the disciple leaning back against Jesus said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, is he whom I will give this morsel of bread with I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped his, the morsel, he gave it to Judas, Simon, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now the Son of Man is glorified. The plan's in motion. It's going to happen. And it's just not going to happen days from now. It's hours. And this is what we're dealing with in the upper room. And he's speaking in this in the, in the sense that, imagine her, hearing these um, scriptures and saying, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And here he is. Satan enters him, and he's going to betray him. So he went out, Satan entered him. See, there was new instruction, wash, cleanse, serve. There was new news, someone's going to betray me. There's a new commandment, and it's going to bring a new covenant. Jesus Christ will make all things new, and Jesus would fulfill every cup that is recounted and hidden in the Old Testament, and bring all things to completion. The cup of sanctification, John 17, 19. And for their sake I consecrated myself, that they also may be sanctified. The cup of deliverance, John 8, 32. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. You will be delivered. The bondage will fall. The cup of redemption, Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so he might receive, we might receive adoption as sons. And because of your sons, God has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. The cup of praise, John 15, 11, that my joy might be in you and that your joy may be complete. The cup before Christ that said he would not drink it again until the time he is with his Father in glory was given for your joy that it might be complete. This joy looks forward to the completed work of redemption and the glorification of the saint. In other words, as we celebrate the Lord's table tonight, we remember the purposes in which we came tonight, the significance of the evening, the institution of the Lord's Supper, and why we gather, that he alone 
will satisfy all the decrees of God and sanctification and deliverance and redemption and all praise to God. His glory through His love. So as we celebrate the Lord's table tonight, we remember all of which Christ has done for the glory of the Father. We prepare now as we, we go through the process of self-examination. I love Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. This was David's words. That we might be washed that we might come into the knowledge of the truth of him and revere him as Christ. This table is symbolic in many ways, yet the reality to a greater glory and love, now being constrained in heaven by God, but will come to completion in Christ. So there is a purpose behind everything. There's significance behind everything. But there's theology behind everything. All of God's glory, all of God's love demonstrated in Christ. These are the, this is biblical truth. This is expect, what we expect. This is our expectation for the believer. The remembrance of the Lord's table fills our hearts with fulfillment and expectation. We think about what he's done and yet we know that there's more that he's going to do. And it's such a powerful, powerful time as we wait and longing for him. It points forward to a greater feast. A greater time of glory awaits at the marriage feast of the Lamb. This is what Daniel, the prophecy in Daniel, chapter 12, 2 and 3. Many of those who fall asleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. There's theology here throughout the Bible. Let me give you some other verses. You, here's the reference and you can read them on your own time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What a powerful verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. And to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God and the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteousness made perfect. Oh, let me go all the way to Revelation. Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to be clothed herself in fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And an angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. See, this is no ordinary meal. Just like the Passover meal was no ordinary meal. They had to prepare themselves to go. Can I tell you, this meal we remember, but it prepares us to go. There's another feast. There's a feast in heaven. There's a feast that's been set aside for those who believe in him. That there'll be glory someday. The trumpets are going to sound again. See, this is not an idle tale. He celebrated the Passover because it was real history, a real movement of God. And God sent the angel of death to bring judgment upon the firstborn. And now the judgment of the firstborn is going to be on the son himself, the one who knew no sin, became sin for us. He was going to pass over once again, carry it to the grave. Oh, please come tomorrow night. It begins in the garden, the agony. But the tomb will be empty. The tomb will be empty. There's a greater feast. Beloved, this was the purpose before the foundation of the world. There's a great necessity for us to remember. It's significant 
for us today to bring us to remembrance, to the reality of the cross, and to revive us with the hope that is yet to come, that already and not yet. This is really, truly a love that's beyond measure in our Savior. So, beloved, tonight, as if we were coming in to the upper room together, the Lord would say, come. He would say, come. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this table is for you. It's been lavished in grace and blood. Sacrificial lamb that we could partake in a meal to remember him, to think of all that he's done, and yet focus us forward to strengthen us in our faith, to cleanse us, that we could move on with great expectations of the future. The Lord says, come. The Lord will say, partake. And to enjoy the glory of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, as we think about this moment, and we, we know this. We know this account, Lord. So we don't want to make it just this routine thing. Lord, we really want to see. We want to go underneath the surface. We want to know those intimate thoughts, intimate prayers of the upper room discourse, Heavenly Father, and the promises that you made when you lifted the bread and you gave thanks to God and when you took the cup in the same way. So, Lord, we pray today. We ask, Heavenly Father, God, that you'd push aside all these things, Lord, that we would know the truth of what the scriptures say, Heavenly Father, that we were destined, we were destined to be raised in contempt, but no, by the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, your divine Son, that we could be risen in glory. So, Heavenly Father, as we approach this table tonight, Heavenly Father, we say thank you, God, we remember everything that you've done on that cross of Calvary. We know that you were silent before Pilate and carried away, pierced for our transgressions. Heavenly Father, crushed for our iniquities. Lord God, we, we pray as we part, ready to partake, Heavenly Father. We think about our minds and our lives, God. Are they worthy? Are they worthy of your love? And we don't know, but Lord, again, you lavish grace from heaven. So God, we, we ask, Lord, now tonight that we could spend time with you, that we could recline at your table, that we could seek you while you're here, Heavenly Father. So God, we just ask all these things in the precious name of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Amen. So tonight, in a short communion meditation, in John 14, 1 through 6, in the upper room, he said this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have, not, would I have told you? that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the, w the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said this to them, I am the way. Jesus saying to them, I'm the cedar. I'm the order of things. I'm the way of things. I am the way. He is the way and fulfillment. It would be his body given, the bread. It would be his blood, the cup of redemption. He's the truth. He's the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman would come and crush the serpent's head and he would bruise his heel. 
He's the truth. He's the absolute truth. He's the absolute lamb. He's the lamb of God who come to take away the sin of the world. See, he's the life. Isaiah prophesied to this. Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. He's the life. He's the atonement of sin. The sufficient sacrifice of heaven. He is the one. He is the divine one. The holy one of Israel. He says in the upper room that he's the true vine. True Israel. All that abide in him are his. And they will bear much fruit. And there is no greater fruit to bear than will be bear what would be born in heaven. The fruit of your life. The fine linens, it says, in Revelation, will be the righteous deeds of the saints. And will be made known in heaven. He's the life. So as we prepare, I want you to see that this text tonight was about God's glory and his love, unmeasured love.